Hello, extra time. Are you part of the league not to get a hug? Because it, it damages your reputation. It, it makes people, when they read it, just laugh at you. Welcome back to the Extra Time Daddy Sportscast. I warned you I'd have some Treaty United shows coming up pretty soon. I'm glad to say we do today. Dave Rooney of Treaty United is going to join us uh, to talk about his side being the flagship team going out and representing Limerick in the WNL. Some five months after we did our WNL preview, I figured out today, which is, uh, I'm glad that wasn't a total waste of time for anybody. At least, though, we uh, get to talk about it today, although not in the happiest of circumstances, Treaty well beaten for their first game, but I'll get into that with Dave in just a little bit. Right now, I'm joined by Mark Darfers and Andrew Dempsey. And lads, we're going to get on to some of the Premier and First Division action after the interview with Dave. But we have to talk a bit about the European draw and more sort of pressing news up north. Linfield's Champions League preliminary round game against Kosovan side FC Dritte has, I was going to say, be postponed, but it's, it's more or less been called off. Friend of the show, Mark McIntosh, I saw him reporting on Twitter there that um, it's likely that Dritte will forfeit the game and Blues will be awarded a 3 0 victory. Uh, final decision to be taken by UEFA control and disciplinary body tomorrow morning. So we'll see a little bit more on that. Essentially, it's down to a second player testing positive for, for COVID in that team. So it looks unlikely they'll be able to play. We've talked a fair bit about this. What I'd like to do here is I'd like to ask you, I suppose, a two-part question. Um, is it just the, the big leagues like in England that they'll be able to have this go off without a hitch? And uh, Because you know they're relatively moneyed and they're working in a bubble. And is that fair? Should the, the likes of Drita be punished and, and eliminated from competitions because of this? Well, I think they were the rules, Declan, that you could move matches within, like we've seen Dundalk's game being moved um, away because the country they were playing wasn't on the green list. So, um, But up until, I think, 48 hours before the game, they can kind of do stuff. But if close to then, if, if something happens within the host club, I think that was the case. So, yeah, I think the expectation is that Linfield will get a walkover. It's it's difficult to stomach though. Like if that was if that was the other way around. Yeah, yeah, it is. The only thing is that the the games need to be played, and you can't really, you know, you can't really drag it on after. There's quite a wide gap actually between this second qualifying round. So the first qualifying round, so the second qualifying round, which the um, League of Ireland clubs are in, um, you know, with matches are on the 27th. The next round isn't until the 17th of September. So. Um, it really just depends on what's happening with the virus and what the kind of host governments are deciding about travel arrangements. But um, yeah, it is a bit of a concern. I'm trying to put it at the back of my mind. You want to see these four League of Ireland clubs have these matches and, and try and go try and go through. And, you know, this week we've seen Europa League happening in Germany in a bubble and Champions League is happening in Portugal in a bubble. And, you know, that's the best way of, of doing things, trying to travel, like the idea of, you know, getting flights to certain venues, you know, around Europe when when the coronavirus is still, you know, pretty pretty rampant in some countries. Like the one thing is that UEFA are putting money up if matches need to be moved to neutral venues. And, and the other thing that normally happens is when the, the European draws and matches are happening normally in July, it's really, really expensive to charter a flight. Um, mm. I'd imagine that probably the price of a charter flight has gone down considerably simply because there's so many planes uh, sitting on tarmacs around Europe. But uh, the disappointment is for League of Ireland clubs that three of the four teams are having to travel away, you know, and only one is at home. And, and you know, while the money's there and it's not going to be as expensive, it's a one-off game. Um, obviously, you'd most prefer to be playing at home, giving yourself a, a best advantage trying to get through to the next round. I don't, I don't really see, though, if this is going to keep popping up, how this is going to be feasible for, as you said, I, I, know, I know it's early days. I'm not going to start talking about, um, you know, if this keeps coming back. But if you look at Scotland at the moment, they've had outbreaks because people have been careless there. Um, we had an incident in Waterford. Obviously, it's, it's turned out to be negative, and, and thankfully, that's good news. But you can see that there is an increase in these cases in the leagues uh, or around the continent like essentially it's, it's, it is down to finances it is down to being unable to well I, 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 not in the case of Scotland like Aberdeen no. players went, went out um, yeah. you know went out on a Saturday night you, to the bar where the, you know you, and then surprised? I mean Liverpool when they won the league were all 
together at a hotel when they claim they yeah, should. Yeah, that's all fine. But the Aberdeen players, I think, went out, like, went out to a normal bar and, and there was a number of cases. Like the Celtic player travelled by all accounts without his clubs knowing to another country. So, uh, like, that was for a one day. What's the point at that point? Well, the rules are the rules. And, 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 and I think that's all you can do at this stage is you mm. know what countries are on the green list. You know, the, they're putting the arrangements in place and teams need to follow them. And if they don't, uh, you know, we don't know necessarily know what's happened with the opposition for, for Linfield. You know, these things can just happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you just, the guidelines are there and clubs need to s- stick with them. Yeah, concerning nonetheless, like, I yeah, am, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm concerned what level this is going to keep happening. I know this is early days and we're able to talk about it a little, a little bit like it's relevant to the league here, but it is a, a larger problem across the European football. And, and, you know, you do fear like we're just going to hit a wall at some point, which won't be able to continue. And the teams are just going to have to take buys and, and be knocked down and all that kind of stuff. Um, but look, we'll, we'll wait and see as, as it develops. As I said, that news will be breaking tomorrow and confirmed tomorrow. So we'll wait to see what comes from that. We'll talk a little bit about the, the European draws then. I, I don't want Mac Dara's take on this just yet because I feel like it'll be a little bit uh, tinted. But I think Shamrock Rovers have a, have a handy draw um, when looking at, at everybody else as they take on Finnish side Ilves. Uh, Ilves Tampere, I think it is. What do you think, Andrew? Well, compared to the side that Bowles got, I think Rovers have got quite fortunate. Even at the size that they could have drawn, they weren't exactly world beater so you know look um, it's, a, it's a good draw for them I think obviously if they go through it'll be worth a few bit and look if they if they get knocked out you'd be very very disappointed I think I do think they have a really good chance made all the more by the fact that it'll be in, in Ireland because they're on the, the yeah. green as well so I really do think they're superior side judging from these two sides I mean uh, the Finnish sides in general wouldn't have a huge amount of European pedigree certainly these guys don't I'm trying to think back to any Finnish sides that you would have seen Hacker maybe Helsinki probably yeah, I'll think you. I'm I'm full of Finnish football stories. Oh, are you? Well, do you, come on over and, and tell us. Cool. Just don't don't yeah, don't yeah, tell yeah. us how difficult Shamrock Rovers have it here and why. I just want to hear. No, this. well, there's a, there's a there's a friend of mine who spends a bit of time in Finland, so I'm I'm just going to rob their tweet about uh, Tampere, also known as the Bobcats. So they had a good season last year. They did win the the cup, so it's two cup winners going head to head. But they've played, they've scored six goals in the last six games, one win in the last seven. So. Um, the other thing, just from a Finnish point of view, Rovers played Raps Rovaniemi back when Pat Fenham was manager. They lost first leg 2-0, two, two so back in 2016, I think it was. And uh, Fenham then left and Stephen Bradley took over as caretaker manager in the way like they drew drew one all um, against Finnish side. So yeah, the, the it was definitely the probably the best draw they could have got and then just getting it home just for the myriad of reasons that I mentioned earlier on just makes a big difference you know yeah it would be very disappointing if they if they didn't get through uh, on this the important thing to say I think over everything is have you seen their crest or their little badge which is yeah, like, um, like a knockoff of the it's like a knockoff of the Partick Thistle one done by David Shrigley the artist yeah, the little I think angry I, son man yeah so I think it was Pogue McGall retweeted somebody saying it's great that uh they let the chairperson's son have a go at doing the mascot or doing the crest. So, yeah. <laughs> Elsewhere, Dundalk, interestingly, are going to be playing a Slovenian side, NK Kelje, uh, in Hungary. As you mentioned earlier, McDowell, UEFA are going to be providing a, a travel grant for that, um, for, for Dundalk getting to Hungary. Uh, I didn't notice that earlier. I, was, I didn't actually realise that was part of the rule. So, that will be, that'll be interesting. Dundalk wouldn't need that as much as some of the other clubs, I feel. I don't think they're going to return it to UEFA and go, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, they'll uh, gladly accept it. Absolutely. I, I wouldn't be as confident for them now. This looks actually a very tough draw, I think. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not an easy, easy draw. And that, like Dundalk were seeded, um, and the opposition aren't, aren't seeded, but simply just because Slovenia don't have a very good uh, kind, of, kind of record on that. So, uh, like in, in, in recent years. So, yeah, no, they are a good side. The, the good thing is if Dundalk can get through, they'll be home in the next round, at least, so they won't have to travel away, and that would be to either... I wouldn't, the be, side. I wouldn't be worrying about that if I was them. I'd be con- constrained on the game in front of them, because I think that... Uh, Certainly, you could be a League of Ireland manager with that kind of attitude. You're just yeah. looking for the next game. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Are Slovenia ahead of, they are ahead of us in the coefficient, aren't they? Slovenia yeah, most, con- most countries, most countries. Right. <laughs> I be- Well, I believe Slovenia are... Uh, maybe, maybe Dundalk sort of... Um, Style will, will, you know, their they're more rounded style might see them better suited to a game like this to defend and, and you know, I mean, the, the issue they had 
against Bowes, according to Vinnie Perth, was that they got caught in the counter attack. So I imagine they'll be trying to do the counter attack in this one. And you should see a little bit of um, likes of and Duffy's pedigree in this one as well, I would have thought. Let's talk then just uh, before we wrap up Bowes uh, take on Fervar, previously known as Videoton. That one uh, passed me by completely. I was thinking, who, who are Fervar? And then you look them up and you look about their past and should have only in Europa League group stages with Chelsea. Was it last year or the year before? Last year, wasn't it? The Sarri year. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. So again, looks a very, very tough one for them. That is, that's a way as well. Their squad is, their squad is stuck full of internationals. Well, yeah, no, tough, tough draw. Yeah. I'm going to talk in a bit more detail later about probably the depth that's in Bo's team that I did figure they had. So maybe I'm, I'm underselling them a bit here, but um, yeah, team with some serious pedigree there for them. And then Derry, they have to go to Lithuania to, Lithuania to take on uh, FK. Uh, Rier, Rier I. And I read a piece in the, in the Der- Derry Journal there today pointing out that uh, Ali Gilchrist would have faced him previously with St. Johnston uh, when they were knocked out 3-1. I thought, interestingly, he mentioned in that that uh, the Scottish side were sort of looking at them as a bye, sort of looking at the next round. I'm amazed that, that St. Johnston thinks like that, that any Scottish side thinks like that. I don't think there's not much recent European pedigree in Scotland like for any of them to be thinking that way. More often than not, they're out in the... I mean, you wouldn't catch any of... The Irish side's thinking that way now, at least, would you? No, no. So I was, I was amazed that that I'm, I'm not saying he did now himself, but he, he he did say that. All right, so pretty interesting one. But uh, again, Derry have a pretty tough there playing in Lithuania. That side has got uh, their first league win in the bag. I think they've got a cup final coming up. And to me, Derry look like in recent years. Anytime you kind of had a little bit of hope for them in Europe, they've they've gotten tonked. I think probably Shamrock Rovers through and, and the rest are all going to struggle. Dundalk's going to go to Penos again or something. Well, the thing about Dundalk is they, without, throughout their squad, they've got experience of playing in Europe. Like the difficulty for Bohemians is that they don't have, you know, they haven't been involved in, in Europe. And so just having that experience and suddenly it's just kind of this one off tie. You don't have, you know, your home leg in front of a, a packed tenement park and, and that's really going to make a difference. But, mm. you know, Dundalk have that pedigree in, in, in Europe. Now they've, other players that they brought in new to the squad for for this year, but you know they kind of I I'd, I'd I'd like to think they'd probably still be able to get through, even though it is a tough draw. You giving Shamrock Rovers a chance and the other three, yes or no? Yeah, I I think Rovers and and Dundalk have just got experience from within the Dundalk side to uh, side to get through. Um, I just think that was the quality of opposition. I think they are particularly unlucky. With who who they've got, like the record for League of Ireland sides away from home is really tough. It is a neutral venue away from home, so you can't just look at the previous records and go, oh, "That's what the away records were." Probably Rovers is a cert, I think Dundalk, probably not, but they probably can if you get me. And then the other two, probably not. And of course, it's worth saying that that Dundalk are in the Champions League, and even if they do lose, they get they drop into yeah. the Europa League, whereas it's. Um, one shot only for, for the teams that are already in the Europa League. We're going to talk to Dave Rooney of uh, Treaty United next, and then we'll jump into a couple of games. And there's kind of a lot of grumbling about maybe we don't have enough Premier League players, but in terms of the Championship, as a... But what's the point in grumbling about it? But the step I, can, I, I can't hold about it, can I? If, if they're not playing the Premier what's the point of me grumbling? The step up to international football in the championship is it kind of is it easy to manage? Well, I tell you about when we played in 2002. And what's, what's the point of like grumbling? We had lads who were all at the bottom of the Premier League, real scrapping away, Kins and Matty Holland and uh, Gary Breen who hadn't even got a club. What's, what's the point of like grumbling? So I, I don't subscribe to that. You know, you just whatever it is, whatever I've got, I'll get them together and make the best of them and try and make sure we qualify. Grumbling is not one of the things I do. You can subscribe to each new episode of the Extra Time.ie Sportscast on iTunes. Please give a rating or add a comment there to let us know your views. Dave Rooney, manager of Treaty United, joins me now. Dave, it's a pleasure to have you on. I checked back on our list of shows today that we've done sort of before the, the lockdown. It's been about five months since we did our WNL preview on the podcast, which just seems absolutely nuts to me. I imagine for yourself, you guys have probably felt every minute of it, considering, I mean, the work that would have gone in on your side even before that point. Yeah, it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy um, few months. Obviously, the, the stuff that went on uh, prior to the start of the season was well documented. Prior to the start of the, the, the original start of the season was well documented. You know, the changeover from the from the previous club to the, to then Limerick United and then the, the legal stuff that went, the ramifications that went around that. 
pre-season was a nightmare. Um, I, I've been on record there saying that we had to start the season in March. We were in big trouble. We were, we were all over the place. Um, we didn't train for most of the month of February due to problems with the name and insurances and things like that. And, and we were we were hemorrhaging players and things like that. So we were, we were in big trouble. But the break actually came for us at a good time. It allowed us to get all the stuff off the pitch sorted out. And, you know, we're in, we're in good shape at the moment. Uh, we had a tough game the weekend. Back training last night and absolutely wasn't a training, you know. So the girls have taken a lot of positives out of the game. So, look, we just want to kick on. We just want to kick on and get going with football. We're delighted to play football. So, please God, you know, everybody can... You know, in and out of football and outside football can be sensible and, and we can keep going with the season, you know. It's interesting from that point of view. I didn't really consider it because I was thinking more along the lines of, um, along with the pandemic, all that kind of pre-season stuff must have given you guys an extra uh, level of, of sort of struggle early on. But I suppose, yeah, it would have given you a bit of time to, to sort things out. I imagine the atmosphere has improved tenfold then because I would have yeah. thought it would be a bit of a, a toxic atmosphere towards the end of last season when all this noise started up. Uh, was, look, at, look, towards the end of last year, we were grand. We knew there was going to be a changeover in players. We were, we were a very, very young squad, you know, so we're bringing all these young players through. We took the decision early part of last year to to invest the time in the youth and invest, um, you know, to invest in the youth. I think we're down well with a few of the older players that were with us last year. Um, well, so probably older is the wrong word, probably more experienced players. They wanted, you know, immediate gains last year, but we, we, we you know, it was always our vision to bring through, through these young players. So, um, you know, we knew we were going to be young this year. Um, we also needed to keep a few of the, the more experienced players as well to, to balance the ship. Um, but we were, in, as I said, we were in a bad shape. Um, the, the break kind of worked out well because we just shut down when, when once they, the, 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 the shutdown came, we actually shut down. We didn't do anything, we, we let the players off. And when we come back then in June, it was a fresh start. It was completely a fresh start. So we got a good six-week pre-season into them, and it was a completely different start. You know, new, new name, new colours, new crest, new everything, and everything I've noticed this year is new. So that was the that was the um, the mindset we took when we started back in June. It was totally new, and, and forget about everything that's gone on in the past. Um, and it's worked. It's worked. Um, a lot of the players there have, have really bought into it. The younger players really feel part of something special now. You know, so look, you know, hopefully. You know, start to start to show the results on the pitch in in the next few weeks. It's probably a strange position, or a bit unusual, I suppose, to be in the sense, as you said, a sort of clean slate. But in a way, you're a flagship for like a whole new team coming through for the next while. I think you said flagship yourself, actually. So I'm probably yeah. robbing that quote directly off you. But it, it's probably an unusual position for a lot of players to be in in that sense as well. That like, I mean, you're you're the the start of what's to come for hopefully the the future of either junior or, or senior soccer in Limerick. Yeah, and, that, and that's what it is. Like, I mean, when the, I remember the press conference, the original press conference, and it was on RT News, and it was Limerick United, and, and Khan was up, and, you know, we're not going to have senior soccer, I think was the name, was, was, was what was said at the meet. We're not going to have senior football here, but we will have it back by next year, you know, and I, so I, I took great offence to that at the time, um, you know, to say, look, we are senior football, and, and you need to recognise us as your flagship team. So, in fairness to the board, to the United board, um, you know, and that's and that's where it's come from. You know, they they do recognise us as their flagship team. We're we're, we're setting the standards. Praise God for the rest of the club coming through. Praise God, there's going to be boys academies and and the senior team there, if not next year, within the next, you know, you know, definitely be a boys academy, and hopefully the senior team will follow. Um, the plan is for next year, you know. So, but we're we're looking to set the standard and set the template. Everything around the club, everything off the pitch sponsorship packages, things like that, player sponsorship packages, kit deals and all that is being done with the whole club in mind, but the, the, the girls are kind of leading the way on it there, you know, so it is, yeah, it's a little bit of extra pressure on us that way, um, obviously all the spotlight is on us, and when you're when you're losing your first game 5-0, you know, but, you know, that's that's the way it is, look, we just take that, we take that as it comes, and, and you know, the girls are working hard, I can't fault any of them, for, any of them for, for the effort they're putting in, and, and the time they're putting into it, they give them sort of some serious time, yeah. um, as you know, they're all volunteers, um, you know, they're all amateur players. Nobody's getting paid to play. Um, so they're giving up some serious time and, and, and they're happy to do it. They're happy to do it. In fairness to the club, they're recognising them and they're recognising the time they're putting in. So, yeah, we are the flagship team and in, in, in Limerick and hopefully we can get people on side as well. You mentioned the, the 5 0 defeat. I suppose we better touching the football, not just the off the field stuff as well. Probably not an ideal game to start on, given the, I mean, P Match on at the bit, full of internationals as well. Um, and, and looking at reports and watching the highlights back, it didn't necessarily look a 5 0 loss. It might have just been, by the looks of it, that P Match experience probably probably showed a bit. They scored some pretty serious goals as well. Yeah, look, they're, look, P Match are class. P Match are top side. Like, uh, there's no weakness in the team. Like, and and they're not just top from one to eleven; they're top from you know one to one to twenty five. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's players in in team you know twenty twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four that would walk into most other teams, 
um, in the league, that's that's a different matter as to you know you know are they helping out with the strength of the league. But well, Piedmont have to do what Piedmont do. They're, they're they're looking after themselves and and, and they're looking at uh, the Champions League campaign this year so but they're, they're a top side there's no weaknesses in the time look they took the game very very seriously I, I said before if we were going to you know catch them on the hop the first game of the season is, is probably the time to do it but there was, there was no like I mean they were they were right at it from the start and yeah. you know like James made a comment before the match that it was a cup final and they kind of laughed it off and says yeah but no it was he, you could see the guards were right up for it like they were you know they were really, really at it in the first minute. So look, they're top side. We stuck in, we stuck in well. I said it to the girls. You know, if you can see it early, just stick in the game and, and and stay in for as long as you can. And we were well in the game for sixty minutes, like just five minutes before half time. Created the chance, couple of corners there just before half time. We actually didn't want the half time whistle. We were we were well in the game, and then we came out with the first ten, fifteen minutes, second half, and and when I had a, had a good raffle up, and but we can say there's a sloppy tour goal and that kind of deflated us, and that was that was the end of the game from then on. We were kind of hanging on a bit now. Look. It was five nil, five nil, five nil. As I said, we we have a couple of games coming up now that where we're looking to to kick on. We have a ten game, ten day break now to the Cork game, and, and we're looking to kick on with that one. And first home game in the Market Fields for for three D United. And please God, we can get, get something out of that game, start building a bit of momentum, and taking it to the DLR game. Then after that, mm. just on the rest of the squad, I mean, you've carried over a few from the, the Limerick FC squad the previous year. You've lost a couple of players, like of Sylvia G. Um, I even saw Carries Johnson signing for Cork as well. Would have grabbed a few goals through some recent seasons. So you've had to do a bit of recruitment. Uh, you've managed to hold on to Marie Curtin as well. But obviously you talked about, about a lot of the young players coming through. Um, Eva Horgan's a good example of that. Someone who would have been with the Ireland under-17s and the European League yeah. even going well enough last year. With, with so much going on, I suppose, on and off the field and with the pandemic, has it been hard to, to get the recruitment right and keep the team intact as well as uh, earlier you were hemorrhaging players? Like yeah, it was, it was really hard. Like we lost, we lost Avian Clancy. I was, I was good at over that one. Avian was a smashing player. She went to Wexford. You know, I was looking to really build a midfield around Avian this year, but um, there was too much uncertainty around the club. I know her mum and dad well. She's, you know, she's, she's a winner. She's a born winner and I, I, I get why she wanted to go. Um, you know, she couldn't take the chance on, on another, you know, mess of a season. So, she went. Um, we were very lucky to hold on to Aoife. Aoife was 50-50 at the time, especially with all the messing going on. But you know, I, you know, I got on well with Mary. She's uh, Aoife's mom, and I think Rebecca coming back also had a big part to play with it. You know what I mean? So it's more than that. The two, the two shines more than that. Shine. I think they're two fantastic players. I think they've been overlooked for uh, international squads in the last few years. Please God, we can get them into into um, into the picture. They'll play plenty of games for us this year. Um, you know, but there's a lot of lot of young players there. But Look, we, we knew early we were going to lose Sylvia. Sylvia kind of made her made, made her mind up early enough that she wasn't going to come back, and um, so that's why I needed to get a couple of girls in, a couple of experienced girls. Maggie became available fairly early from Cork as well, so um, I knew Maggie from being around the league as well. So um, we got Maggie and, and through Maggie we kind of picked up on Tara then as well, and we were hoping to get one or two more from that area as well. They went they went elsewhere instead, you know what I mean? But you know they, they've been they've been a massive. Um, you know, feel for us to get them in, just just level heads and in around training. You know, I don't think Tara's missed a training session yet this year. You know, she's a great girl around the place. Um, our confidence was very low when she came in, but we're, we're starting to build it up gradually. And she's, you know, we're, we're starting to see it now. You know, she, she's going to be well up for the car game next week. You know, so there's plenty more other than Aoife and the two shines. You know, Cara Griffin had a good good little patch there towards July and August there last year. Claude Doherty's a fine player. Alana Mitchell. Has been up with the under 19s as well, you know what I mean? So, you know, really, really, some really, really good young players. And then when you look down below them, you know, Janice Lattery would have come on second half. She's an under 16 and 17 international. Adam Casey started the game, April Sullivan started the game as well. They're all under 17s. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, really, really good squad of under 17s. So that's that's the way we're going to go. Um, to, it'll take two or three years to bring all these players through, but once we get them through, we're going to be fine. So, it, and they're all they're all Limerick, Limerick girls, Limerick and Clare, Midwest girls. So, you know, you know, if we look after them, I don't see any reason for them to go anywhere else. And that's 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 what we're looking to do and, and build build a, a real uh, you know team of Midwest players um, and and see so if we can kick on them. It's a proper time for a project like this as well, in the sense that the league looks have gotten a bit of a shake up for those who, who probably don't follow the, the league all that much. There's a, a sort of new structure to it now. In the first phase you're all gonna play each other once and then in the second phase it'll sort of split off into into two groups. I suppose traditionally people like to stick with the, with the league format, but I, I think it's, it's like funny to... actually. It's funny because we would have put in a proposal at the end of last season, as 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 Limerick FC we would put a proposal into the league because the, the league was very lopsided. There was a top yeah. four, there was a bottom four, and this was before um, Athlone and Bowles were coming in. This was when Kilkenny were still in the side. So we would have actually put a proposal into the league 
um, to split the league, to go, you know, everybody play one or two rounds of games and then split it because we, we found it really, really hard for the third round of games. Um, girls were going back to college. We were, you know, bottom end of the table and it was really hard to motivate them and get them going. So we just felt that if there was a kind of a bottom section or a shield section, whatever you wanted to call it, that it might keep girls in, in, in the league a little bit longer. Um, but it was shot down. It was shot down by all the clubs. So, you know, um, they, you know, all the clubs wanted to keep the, the, the remaining structure. So then when this COVID came around and then they said, we're going to go with this structure, it was funny the way it worked out. But um, look, it's there's, there's plus and minuses for it. You know what I mean? Obviously, it has to be done for, um, to get all the games in and to get some sort of um, integrity to the league. It has to be done. And I think it's a good way of doing it. I think everybody plays each other once and then they'll split top five, bottom four. But what it does give us now is something tangible. Like, you know, the start of the last couple of seasons, we were looking at the table saying, like, well, you know, we're not going to win the league. What's there for us? Mm. You know, FAI Cup and the, and the League Cup. The League Cup is taken away this year. There's not enough time to get it in. So it gives us something tangible to aim for. Can we get into that top five? And I think that is achievable. I think, you know, the top three, and I throw Galway in there and, and make it a top four. I think Galway are a very good side as well. But, mm. you know, after that, I think we're all competitive with each other. And I think... It'll be interesting to see who, who makes that top five. And that's that's our aim for the year. That's that's the target we've set the girls. I think there's going to be a few upsets this year. I think the way the, the league is, I think there's pressure on the top teams as well. You can't afford to slip, you know, with it with it basically you're looking at a twelve team or sorry, twelve game division or twelve game league. You you can't afford to slip. Like Team couldn't afford to slip last weekend. Right. Shells like team out around the cork next weekend. That's it. That's a tricky one for them. Shells, you know, all of these games are going to be tricky, and all it takes is is one of these top teams to slip. So I think it's you know it's going to make it interesting from from that point of view as well. Um, you mentioned Cork a few minutes ago there. Just I suppose that's the the next game up as you said. A bit of a break until that, but uh, they'd have put up to Shells pretty well. You've got a, a big sort of monster derby now coming into into the market's field with yourselves. How do you, how do you fare ahead of that game? Yeah, we're okay. Look, we look. Before the P's, I didn't make a, a, big, a big issue out of it. Before the P's game, we lost four players. We lost two uh, on the Thursday night before before the game. Like four, three of them definitely would have started the game. You know, Alana Mitchell uh, definitely would have started the game. Lauren Kane probably definitely would have started the game as well. You know, so we, we lost three players. Claude Doherty definitely would have started the game. So we lost we lost four players just before the game. Alana definitely won't make it back. Um, Lauren's 50-50. Claude will definitely be back. She trained last night, so she'll be back. So we'll be stronger than we were against P Mount. Um, Anna Shine is, is fully fit now. She'll she'll definitely be back for the for the Cork game. So we're in good shape going into Cork. I watched I watched I was up in Talk of Park. I went to the game before before P Mount. I went up to, to watch the Cork and Shells game. Um, Shells are good so Shells are pretty, pretty good. They knock it around. Um, if you stand off them at all, they just pass you to death, you know. So they're a good side. But Cork, in fairness, have a lot of young players there, some smashing, um, some smashing young players, and um, you know, a bit of experience in midfield as well. Becky Gasson's come in this year; she's she give them a bit of a steal in midfield. But they have Ava, Ava Omani, who's you know senior international. Zara Foley, who I would have worked with all the way up through schools as well, smashing player Maria in goal, you know, really good goalkeeper. So you know, Cork are similar enough to ourselves, a few young players, but a few uh, senior senior pros in in there. And of course, Sir Shannon on her day. Is unplayable. She's one of the best players in the league on her day. You know what I mean. So you know, she. I remember the. the I think it was the second game of the, is the season when we played two years ago. First game we we beaten Kilkenny. We went down to Cork and Sir she had beat us on her own. It was two one, but she scored two crackers that day. You know, we were well in it. But you know, so Cork, Cork were a good side, similar enough to ourselves, and be a cracking game. Once a derby, all of that stuff. Evening, evening game under lights, markets, fields, hmm. kind of great buzz around it as well. You know what I mean. So yeah, looking looking forward to that. Really. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Well, Dave, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. Uh, one more request for you, I suppose. I, I, I noticed a few of us kind of waiting out there to get, and I can see you got the, the Treaty United uh, gear on you at the moment. There's a few of us waiting for, for some sort of Treaty United gear that we can get our hands on. Can you have a, a word with the lads up top and, and let us know maybe when we can grab ourselves a jersey or some sort of Treaty swag? Yeah, what you need, whatever you need, it's just banging on to be there. We get it, we get it up to you. Loads, loads of spare jerseys at the moment. We, <laughs> we, yeah, uh, we went mad with the kid, the kid ordered at the start of the year. So Umbro, Umbro, very good to us. Malcolm, he's, he's a smashing lad. Umbro, there, he's very good to us. Uh, turned around the gear really, really quickly. So whatever you need, let us know. We will get it up to you. When it's done, well, all the treat United fans listening in heard that one, and they'll be <laughs> on the club no end now on Twitter. Thanks a million, Dave. Fair play, kid. Thanks, pal. Gareth Penrose isn't exactly Alexander Graham Bell. But the Dubliner did bring Irish football into the modern era with the establishment of ExtraTime.ie. Hello, Extra Time. Thanks for your support. You are the 12th man. So in some ways, Penrose is a pioneer. 
website has evolved to include weighty opinion pieces, coverage of women's football, and a regular podcast. podcast. Greg Bolger, as a player of some technical ability, that some is probably a bit disingenuous to uh, your Just some! Just some! Thanks, guys. Just some. Well, here's something back, Mr. Penrose. Thank you. I don't do it so they turn around and go, well, thank you, David. Thank you for the laughs. I do it so one day someone will go, there goes David Brent. I must remember to thank him. Plenty of paces to jump in here, but we'll start right off with uh, Dundalk dropping points and uh, Rovers picking up more points, McDarrett. A little smile creeping in there at this stage, getting a bit getting a bit giddy. I mean, Twardek and Bowles are absolutely on fire for about 15 years. He, 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 he yeah. was unbelievable. So I watched the first half in, in Eddie Rockets in Donnybrook on my way to Belfield on, on Friday. I, I was treating myself and sending pictures to the extra and WhatsApp group, and, which didn't and, go, didn't go and, down very well. It was infectious because after that, I was like, ah, for fuck's sake, I've ordered any rockets immediately after that then. <laughs> so there are obviously other takeaway establishments if anyone wants to come in sponsors. But, but the benefit of Watch LOI is that you could watch it on, on your phone. So yeah, I saw the first half and Tordex seemed to be doing seemed to be doing really well. And uh, like the, they were well taken goals. So I didn't see the second half, but Bowes played, Bowes played very well. And yeah, just a lot of drop points for, for Dundalk, which... You know, they started slowly last season um, and, and Rovers had started really well and then dropped off as, as Dundalk just kicked into gear relatively quickly once the season got going. But of course, in an 18 game season, they don't have that, uh, that real room, you know. I think also, if you, I, mean, I mean, I just want to give a, a specific mention to the second goal, which I thought was a magnificent. Um, McGuinness, was, his kickouts were, were really, really good. And I'll kind of come on to him in a, in a minute. But his kickout to Twardock went into space and lovely footwork and a deep cross. Even though I don't think he intended it to go where it did, I think he was more going back post. But lovely cross for it to be then cushioned down to Buckley to slot in. I thought it was a really, really nice goal. I'm not, I'm not really having Vinnie Perth calling that sort of counter-attack necessarily because, I mean, there is chances to clear that. I, I, there's a few questions about Dundalk just before we praise Bowes a bit further here. They, I, I, I don't want to keep hammering them, but they don't look that impressive watching games. And, and while they control the rest of that game, or certainly the second half for a large part, they, they, just, they just don't really blow you away. Moving Kolovic, obviously, onto the right seemed to help, where him and, and uh, Duffy are, are linking up beautifully again. So their goal, to be fair to them, was, was fantastic. But even you look at the defence at the moment, I've seen a few Dundalk fans wanting uh, Gartland to come back in. I don't know about you guys. I thought Cleary had a bit of an iffy game against Pats at times. Um, I was surprised maybe that they didn't look to make a change there. But I, I'm, I'm not saying that's the, the solution of it all. But it just seems strange. It's been a while since I've seen Gartland starting. Dundalk, maybe you could argue with a couple of games already might want to think about changing one or two things around. But um, to be fair, Huben did smash the crossbar as well. Uh, so they probably should have equalised. Earlier today, I was actually listening to uh, Vinnie Perth. He was doing an interview with his the in-house media at Dundalk. And I suppose he never he didn't give the vibe that he was too worried about their performances, if, if, you, if you get me. It, it was more, he was more concerned that they were ready for Europe in a couple of weeks' time. That was obviously like looking ahead to this week. Obviously, they're playing, I think, Waterford tonight in the Cup and the game ahead over the weekend. But he's, uh, what struck me was that he wasn't actually too bothered by the results. He was more worried about the performances going into Europe. So, look, maybe they are trying to prime themselves for Europe, which I think, look, it, it could be a very um, short-sighted move. But, you know, maybe it could work out for, for his legacy at Dundalk. But mm. I think it's quite short-sighted, personally. Yeah, it's, a, it's a bit of a risk, that if, if you... And, and maybe they're not, maybe we're just picking up wrong. But it's a bit of a risk to, yeah. to, to do that. And, and, again, look, as McDara pointed out, look, they... They have slow, slowly started before, so we'll probably be eating these words in about a week or two when they're back to absolutely smashing everybody and, and rolling the league in again. But to me, I don't think, I don't think Shamrock Rovers look quite like giving it up this time. I think everyone kind of had that feeling last year anyway that the tide might be turning a little bit. And, and even when you look, if you look at that Derry game, they're having that little bit of luck that maybe Vinny could probably argue Dundalk Aaron with, with the Hooban header. Mind you, uh, Bose probably had a couple of more great chances. Sorry, before I move on from Bose, probably didn't give them enough credit for the depth they have in their squad. Like even um, Talbot being out, McInnes coming in. You still got uh, Finnerty and and Corcoran and um, Levingston and, and players like that on the bench. Which uh, you know, Levingston, Finnerty, and and Talbot would have been pretty instrumental players for them um, last year. So I, I I think for Bose that's important to know as well because like with all these games coming kind of thick and fast. They will have options to, to bring in here, and, and uh, they're, look, they're looking quite good, I must say. But yeah, 
maybe Dundalk can argue they're not having quite the same fortune with, you know, that Hooban header not going in. And, and you look at Shamrock Rovers game like that, there was, I, I thought more than a, a hint of good fortune about it. I know you make your own luck a lot of the time, but um, the Horgan own goal and just one or two other elements like that. You know, to be fair, Alan Man has some great saves at the end as well, but may, maybe just getting a little bit of rub of the green or, or in good form, so it's working out for them. Well, I think the Derry City goal was quite fortuitous because that was a cross that just snuck in right off the post, just gone over the, the top of Roberto Lopez's head and just by Alan Manis. Lopez probably should have dealt with that, didn't he? Well, it, I, it just went over his head. So uh, I think it didn't help Alan Manis that it looked like Lopez was maybe going to get to it. But, you know, Manis died full length and it just crept in off the post. So I, I thought Derry were very lucky with that. And that was the only chance of note they created even in the first half and they created very little in the second half until until the very end. I think the difference on the day was being able to make five substitutions, which means that when teams are down, they can actually change things up. So I saw Stephen O'Donnell had done it with St. Pat's earlier on the season and the game was at where he just made two switches at half time and then you know if you did that in the other season you're kind of getting on and saying, well Hopefully no one else picks up an injury or there's no one sent off or, or someone picks up a booking that really might need to take them off. So Bradley Gamble had brought two players on at half time, brought Neil Frugia on in place of Danny Lafferty. And I think that made quite a lot of difference because Frugia brought quite a lot of attacking vigour on that left. And then he made two other substitutions, about a quarter of an hour maybe to go, 20 minutes to go. And they were the two that linked up. So Rory Gaffney came on and... Um, Reese Marshall was involved. He was a sub as well. And uh, Marshall passed to Gaffney, who crossed in for Dean Williams, who was really unlucky not to get his first uh, goal for Rovers' first team. He just His header flicked off the post. And yeah, it was a comedy on goal. So there was the bit of luck I think you're talking about. Yeah. Poor uh, Colin Horgan. It, it came off the post, hit him in the face, and back in, nothing he could do. Um, it's not only a stroke of good luck, though. I, I don't want to kind of denigrate teams by saying lucky and unlucky. Um, it's riding the crest of wave. The four minutes where Shamrock Rovers managed to turn things around completely. They just have a bit of that about them, whether it's touch, mo- touch more momentum about them than Dundalk at the moment anyway, which might yeah, be like the, I- the, ideal like, for this short bursts games. Well, that's it. You've got to turn it around. Like, if... if if Rovers had lost that game 1-0, everything's gone. You know, Bowes has moved into second place in the table as well. And it's it's such a short season that if you can go on a run, it's, it's not a 33-36 game season. But but then the fortune, I think you were maybe talking about Declan, was at the end of the game, Derry hit the crossbar. And uh, uh, somehow, it, like, it, Alan Manis went over his head and he somehow managed to stay in his feet, which meant mm-hmm. when Owen Toll came in with the header that himself and Lopez were able to to shuttle it out and um, you know that's that's the home when you come away losing the game you know you're losing 1-0 with whatever 15 minutes to go and turning it around and then just the manner of even just eking out that win at the end but they did what they, they did what they need to do they're six points clear of Bowes and eight points clear of Upton Dock so um, and yeah. with Pats on Pats on Sunday and Pats were pretty poor in the cup let's touch it let's touch on that game i mean pat's played harps back to back there and uh it, it really was it felt very much a case of like one side shopping it in for another side shopping it in like i don't think harps had a shot or they did have one shot but none on target against uh pats in, in richmond georgie kelly i was gonna say with an instant impact because i keep forgetting about the Derry game where he didn't have an instant impact but any um any script behind saying he could uh, get a run here and go for a top goal scorer, or is that madness? No, he could do. Like I, I was I was there on on Friday for the game at Richmond, and he was the player that I think Pats lacked last season. Like fair enough, they just couldn't score a goal last season, and granted, they probably didn't create as many opportunities. But Pats didn't create much on Friday night against Finn Harps at all, and look, they scored two goals with with two chances, but with Georgie Kelly being somewhat alert and actually after the game it was, it was quite funny because Ollie Horgan was giving his team a dressing down on the middle of the Richmond Park pitch and literally everything that I thought um, Ollie Horgan was just saying to his team and you could hear every single word he was saying but um, when he said it to him in his uh, post-match interview he denied every single word of what he said <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah um, look I don't think Georgie is uh, like look I would have seen a lot of him at UCD as well so it wouldn't surprise me if he went on a 
a mad run and ended up the top scorer in this league, especially with only what eighteen? Well, how many games left? Twelve. Yeah. Twelve games. Twelve, 12 thirteen games left. Yeah, it look, wouldn't surprise me. You would have said you would have watched. Um, we won't talk too much about the cup games because they're they're going on tonight as we're recording this. But uh, Harps obviously got their revenge then in Bally Buffet, and it sounds like Pats just swapped that exact performance. They sound like they were absolutely abysmal. Bit of, bit of inconsistency under under Stevie O'Donnell so far. Do you think? At times they look good when they played Dundalk, and at other times they have been. They've been poor, yeah. I was watching I was watching it last night, like maybe a lot of people, Europa League on what on the television, watch LOI on the on the laptop. But um as you were saying, Declan, just seeing comments from other Pats fans, they were they were pretty poor. Mm. A team who who've been a lot more down than up actually, Shells. Another loss. That that was a pretty interesting game, actually. I didn't really think they were in it for what was that ninety fourth minute goal? I think from Denver's that that, that uh, or from Deegan, I should say Denver's yeah. uh, open the scoring. Um, but what about Sligo? Completely turned it around since the break. We did say, uh, you know, if any team was gonna was gonna go pretty well off the off the restart, it was gonna be them. Uh, and I don't, am I right in saying Junior hasn't even? No, he's not. No, um, and I think I actually said before this started that it was a huge risk uh, signing Junior, and now I've got egg in my face already. So. <laughs> Um, before he's even kicked the ball for them, so well, technically, yeah. you might be right because the way they're going at the moment, they don't need him. They're no. flying it, <laughs> absolutely flying it. Couldn't believe it. Uh, what's going on with Shells? Why are them in so abysmal since coming back? Um, look, I saw them when they played Waterford. I was at that game, and look, it was just personally, I thought it was a terrible game. I don't think you could probably like there's just no flow to it whatsoever, and it probably suited Waterford given this, given the fact that look, they've got a new manager in and. You know they probably didn't have time to play as much as the team as they probably would have liked in the last few weeks. But obviously, I saw bits of them against Sligo, and yeah, they they were never really in it. I didn't think bar the the goal. Well, look, the goal at the end was so late on; they never even looked like they were going to equalize. So didn't actually think Shells were the best team in the first division last year either. So um, we'll we'll probably move on to the first division there. Sorry about that Waterford and Cork, but you played out on nil nil, and uh, it, it looked poor. Points on the board for Cork. That's something. But that's all you're getting this week. Let's talk about the first division then, Andrew. I'm, I'm afraid as it was away for the most part, I, I saw minimal Premier and saw absolutely uh, diddly squat first division. But I did notice there was a couple of interesting results, particularly Cavan Teeley dropping points for the first time this year. And uh, notably Galway still not managing to get points on the board. It's not looking ideal for that project at the moment. But, and I think I said this last week for Galway, and I probably left Cavan Teeley out a bit. Fair few injuries for both. Yeah, no, and look, I know obviously Cabin would be disappointed to get a draw down in Wexford, but it's it's not the worst result if you if you think about the injuries that they had going into the game. They were missing Marty Waters, they were missing Keith Dalton, they were missing Luke Lucas, they were missing Mick Kelly, their goalkeeper, they were missing Connor Keely right before kickoff. They were like, I think they were absolutely they're absolutely decimated by injury at the moment. And look, Wexford aren't the worst side either. Um, they obviously Brian O'Sullivan's brought in a few. Good players, obviously Connor Crowley. He's actually ex captain He didn't really get a chance there last season, but he's starting to show his worth. Uh, Wexford, Dan Tobin as well. I'm sure a lot of people who would have watched the Premier Division last year would know him from his time at UCD. Look, it's it's not the worst result, and look, they actually could have nicked it at the end. I think Rob Dunn had a great chance, and he somehow fired over. I don't know how he did it, but um, yeah, now look, it's it's not the worst result for captain Teddy, but um, I look at per- I think Galway are in serious trouble if they can't get a result on Friday. Big result for Drogheda as well, kicked themselves a few points up, particularly leaves that cut off from Bray at the moment, um, who, who looked to have been starting back quite well, actually, Bray. But uh, solid win for Drogheda, and you, you expect them now, they're only, what, three points off Cabo? They'll be, they'll be there about the only game, won't they? 100%. And look, I suppose I, I was actually surprised that Bray beat Longford on the bank holiday Monday because Bray, they, they weren't in a great shape before and then obviously they drew against Cove on the, the first Friday back so I was like look you'd have to fancy Longford but they went down to Longford and won 2-0 and look it's a great result for them Gary Shaw scored twice if I'm not mistaken I don't really think Bray will be up there in terms of the title and I think draw it look they've got a great squad and look, look I'm sure McDowell would have seen them against Shamrock Rovers too and when they came back from two goals down with 10 men like they, they have quality in that squad and Look, if they're not in that top two, top three this season, I'd be really surprised. Speaking of McDara, what's happening with Shamrock Rovers too? Still with that win, all the bangers they're playing, all the older lads are getting down when they shouldn't be, <laughs> and and they've got no wins and two draws so far. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I was the only journalist uh, working in the 
press box in Belfield on Friday <laughs> night. So I can, uh, yeah, UCD were well worth the well worth the win that night. Uh, Rovers two had no bangers on Friday night. I think when the Rovers first team are playing, following the first division team, they're less likely to have bangers. When it's the other way around, you can get the likes of name scales dropping in. So yeah, no no bangers evolved. So from the games I've been at, that Rovers two team have been unlucky. But I didn't think they were unlucky against CCD on Friday night. I think Andy Myler's team were probably the better team on, on, on the day. I think when everyone had the, the whole the People's League or whatever it was called uh, thing going on, I don't think anyone expected them to be pushing that loan for, for bottom spot when that, was, when that was the case. But maybe we should, maybe there's an argument there that uh, it was a little bit blown out of proportion. But look, that's in the past. We'll leave that there for now. We've got to go because we've got some FAI Cup games starting pretty soon. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to Dave Rooney for taking the call as well. And we'll speak to you next week.